morning. It's so nice to see you. Great to see you. Uh, so Mary, you have been a long time a friend, founder and board member of the Climate Registry. And thank you so much for that and all your support through the years. Uh, you currently are the chair of the California Air Resources Board and you have served on the board under three governors, including twice for Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, you have led the board in crafting California's internationally recognized climate action plan. You also have been an attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council and assistant administrator for U.S. EPA's Office of Air and Radiation. So, Mary, you've been at the forefront of many innovation, innovative air pollution and climate policies in California and nationally. So what is the unfinished business that future climate leaders should focus on uh, to ensure that this important legacy endures? First of all, we have to get back to the recognition that global climate change is in fact a global uh, problem, a global crisis, and get back to working with other countries as well as at the national and local level. This does require the United States government to rejoin uh, the Paris Accord and begin working on the next stage, which was to put in a more ambitious um, determinations of what the nation as a whole would contribute to reductions in greenhouse gases. And there's a lot of other things to be worked on as well, including short-lived climate pollutants, which is a uh, purview of another group that was created uh, under the United Nations, and looking at uh, adaptation, looking at standards for uh, forestry uh, protocols, all of those things are, are really global problems, which the state of California and uh, now joined by a number of other states as well, um, have been actively engaged in, but fundamentally this is something that needs to be done uh, at the national level. So um, as you said at the outset, uh, at this moment, we don't know uh, who our leader will be, but if it is uh, Joe Biden, I know that is on his agenda and that will be uh, one of the very first things that, that needs to be done is for the United States to rejoin the company of nations in both recognizing the science and working on coming up with uh, solutions, which can be different and will need to be different in different places, but which will all be aimed in the same direction and using the same basis of, of knowledge. So you, you've spoken about the importance of, of national action, um, especially dealing with such a threat as climate change. Um, but you also have enormous experience getting things done and making progress at state levels. What advice do you have uh, for others working in government in terms of really building and instituting policies for, longe for longevity? I think um, the, the basic formula for doing the work that I've done is to set ambitious standards that are based on science and then try to develop solutions that uh, while they are as durable as they can be in order to send a message to private investors and to citizens in general about where we're headed, um, allow for flexibility because we find almost invariably that while some obstacles may arise uh, which are uh, based in um, factors, you know, beyond the control of environmental regulators, technology also uh, develops faster and in sometimes different and surprising ways. And we need to be poised to take advantage of those uh, changes as well as to respond when we run up against an apparent roadblock. The whole history of uh, clean air uh, implementation uh, in California and in the country is one of uh, creating a framework with strong uh, standards for environmental quality based on public health protection and then continuously working to improve the, the status of, of the air program and that means um, that from time to time when we set deadlines, the deadlines force action and we can see that sometimes we're able to move faster in some areas than we thought we could. And in other areas, um, we have problems that just continue to, to persist. Um, for example, in California, uh, we have done, I think, a, a world-renowned uh, uh, job in terms of setting 
ambitious uh, emission standards for motor vehicles and fuels. But when it comes to reducing the amount of vehicle miles traveled, which is well, literally where, where the emissions occur, um, we haven't done so well because uh, it was not a simple um, regulatory problem to address the issues of land use and transportation policy that are essential to getting a handle on, on that problem. So uh, there's all these uh, these tools that state governments have, um, but behind them are people, right? So what motivates people and businesses to do the right thing and to take action, especially now that hopefully we'll be looking at a post-COVID uh, decade, hopefully soon, and uh, to keep them motivated and, and working for uh, climate action? I think you have to recognize that um, people in general, including people who work in corporations that um, create pollution as part of what they do, um, want clean air. You know, when, when President Trump uh, on the campaign trail and, and one of the debates announces vehemently, we want the cleanest air, we're going to have the cleanest water, he isn't saying that because he knows what that means actually probably, but what he does know is that that resonates with his audience, whoever they are. Uh, and so he is going to at least verbally express, um, you know, his commitment that those things are going to happen. Now, down in the trenches where people like me and the engineers and scientists and lawyers who work for CARB work, um, we have to figure out how to translate that into reality. And when we try to do that, it, we run up against other uh, obstacles because people don't only want clean air. They obviously want and need jobs. They want and need houses. They want and need to be able to get around, et cetera. So how we reconcile all these things and come up with programs that are multifaceted, that as much as possible don't just um, recognize that there's other issues in the world, but also incorporate them is really, I think, the, the key to success. And that is often referred to as coming out of the silo or breaking down barriers and being able to think about more than one thing at once or craft policies that are, um, you know, have multi-benefits to them, co-benefits sometimes they're called. But that really is at, at the heart of uh, what in a democracy we need to do if we're going to actually continue to advance on uh, on reducing pollution. And I, I think we've seen this where you develop ve very interesting partnerships in order to move policies forward, like with uh, um, automobile industry, parts of the automobile industry mm -hmm. at least. Um, and you also have, California also has a very long history of collaborating with other states and Canadian provinces on climate policy and initiatives from cap and trade to transportation. So what have, what have you found to be the most important lessons learned in terms of building these proactive and productive win-win relationships? Like any relationships, I suppose you have to acknowledge that um, every party has their own uh, reasons for existing, their own reasons for wanting to be in a partnership, and you have to find ways to continually uh, refresh that relationship so that you can um, be able to all feel like you're moving ahead together, getting to know the other people on an individual level that you're working with certainly makes a big difference if you uh, recognize and, and uh, like each other's company, that's always good, but uh, that evolves over time of recognizing that um, you have some common interests and finding ways to advance them together. Well, um, Mary, uh, you are uh, leaving, I believe, still the plan, the ARB board in uh, December or the end of this year, coming up quickly. Um, and what are you looking forward to given in your next chapter, um, given that we don't know the outcome of the election. So well, that may determine something too. You know, first of all, um, 
we are in a time of COVID. And um, I am old enough to be considered in the vulnerable group, even though I don't feel like it. I did get on an airplane um, a week ago, actually, and I went to the East Coast to visit my daughter and her family in Washington, D.C., so I could see my grandchildren back there who I had not seen since January. Honestly, uh, travel was a big part of my plan. Uh, I was uh, planning to go spend um, up to a couple of months uh, abroad, um, partly doing some international visits um, around climate issues uh, with colleagues and former colleagues and partly um, just enjoying some time away. And it's not clear when or if that will happen anytime in the next year or two. Most people now think that, quote, normal travel probably isn't really going to start happening until about 2022. So uh, that's definitely a change that we have to uh, work around and accommodate. Um, I have been planning for some time now to work on a book, which is a, sort of a memoir and history of California's air program. Uh, I'm going to be working on an oral history project with um, the University of California, the Bancroft Library. And um, I, I do want to serve as a sort of an uh, unpaid informal ambassador for California's programs. And so I'll be thinking about where and how to do that. I'm certainly trying to avoid making a lot of commitments right away while I you know, sort of see what happens next. And certainly the opportunities will be very dependent on, uh, on the outcome of the election because either we'll be resisting as we're doing right now, or we will be looking to advance. And uh, if it's the latter, there's going to be a lot of help, uh, a lot of support for that coming from different directions. And it's going to just be exciting to see what happens. Right. Well, well, we'll know soon enough. And uh, I, for one, would very much look forward to reading your book. And I, I look forward to doing that in the future at some point. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mary, thanks again for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It was great to see you. It's a pleasure to see you. And congratulations on all the good work that the registry is doing and your, your evolution also into a more streamlined organization. So I'll be excited to see how that goes. Yes, it's, uh, the registry is working hard. So it's, it's, all, it's good. It's all good. All, good. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Bye.